and thank you for everyone who uh, is joining us for this panel today. I'm the online education editor for US News and World Report, uh, where I explore trends and provide advice to an audience of prospective students. I'm now going to introduce each of our four panelists who will be participating in the conversation, which will focus on the student and faculty experience today in online education. First up, we have Dr. Robert Hansen, who is the CEO of the University Professional and Continuing Education Association, or UPCEA, uh, an organization devoted to professional and online learning. Under Hansen's leadership, the UPCEA has grown by 125% in the past six years. Uh, Hansen was previously an associate provost for university outreach at the University of Southern Maine, a regional public university. Uh, we also have uh, Maria Jump, who is the assistant vice president of student services at CSU Global Campus, uh, where she focuses on improving the online student experience. Uh, she has worked in higher education for about a decade, uh, primarily supporting the needs of non-traditional learners. We also have Sarah Red, a senior manager of human resources and labor relations at Davita Kidney Care, focusing on uh, talent development, organizational strategy, and performance coaching. Um, after 10 years in large corporate function roles, she returned to pursue her master's online in strategic human resources at the University of Denver, uh, where she's currently an online student. And last up, we have Dr. Penelope Adams Moon, uh, Director of Online Programs and Associate Clinical Professor of History in Arizona State University School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, uh, where she oversees the development of high quality online courses and programs. She teaches graduate history courses and publishes on topics related to American peace history and online education. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and now I'd like to get started on the discussion uh, and we'll start with Maria. Uh, so can you please uh, walk us through the typical day, week, month for an online student at CSU Global and kind of tell us a little bit about what uh, class sessions and assignments look like compared with uh, the typical lecture or discussion they, uh, prospective students may think of when they think of a college class? Sure, thanks Jordan. So I think one of the first things to keep in mind is actually that many of our online students are non-traditional learners. They have families, they have full-time jobs, they might be a caregiver for a parent. So in many ways there's not really a typical day or week or month for them and that's why a lot of them choose online education is because of the flexibility it affords they might be doing a reading in a park while they watch their kids play they could be completing assignments on a plane on a work trip or they might have a nightly routine where they're dedicating two to three hours to coursework in their home and they've got a dedicated space and you know they close the door and plug away every single night so it really varies student by student we talk about our courses at CSU Global. They all run in eight week sessions. So it's about half the time that a traditional class uses um, to earn three credits. Inside the classroom, um, it, in many ways, I don't think it's as different as people think um, from a more traditional setting. So each week students are completing readings in textbooks or they might be reading articles. They are participating in class discussions with other students and the instructor and they receive a lecture that might include videos. It could be a, a video from the instructor or different experts in the field talking about a particular subject. They uh, will be reading some things in the lecture and then there's also opportunities, interactive opportunities throughout the lecture for them to check their learning. They completely week weekly assignments, just like you would in a normal class. Um, a lot of times they're papers and there's also an end of course portfolio project that they do. Um, they don't have to be online at any particular time, but there are due dates for all of the assignments and the discussion posts. And the nice thing I think about the online learning environment is that it allows us to seamlessly bring in adaptive learning and gamification technologies that we know millennials and Gen Zs are very interested in and that really meets their learning styles and it helps them reinforce their learning. I think one of the big differences though is in those weekly discussions they actually can be a lot of times more thoughtful than in a face-to-face -face classroom. And I think about when I was in college, especially if you had a large class, it was really easy to sit back and not participate a whole lot, even if there was a discussion going on. And sometimes there wasn't, you might just get lectured to for an entire hour, or hour and 15 minute session. So in our courses, all students have to participate in these discussions. And the nice thing is because they don't, 
happen in a synchronous environment. Students are completing those discussions, their own posts, and then responding to other students' comments and posts. They have the ability to really be thoughtful about what they're saying, do some research, and back up their position with articles or text citations as well. So I think that's one of those big differences is the level of discourse that can happen in, in the classroom. Great, thank you, Maria. And uh, I wanted to move over to Sarah, our online student. Uh, so you earned a degree online. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you liked best about the experience? And at the same time, uh, what was your least favorite aspect of the online uh, learning experience for you? I would say my, my favorite part is what Maria just brought up, um, talking through the discussion posts. And what's different than the actual in-class learning situation is that I'm able to post on Sunday, think about it for a couple of days, respond back to my classmates over the course of the week. And it keeps me thinking about that subject to topic throughout the week, which is great. Um, in a normal classroom, you would think about it as the discussion is going on. And then when you leave the, when you leave the classroom, it's usually the last time you think about it. And so I really like the thought process that happens um, throughout the course of the week, um, really just ingraining the subject matter in your brain. Um, I also like the flexibility. The reason I went back to school online is because I have 90% travel in my full-time job. I can be on the East Coast, I can be on the West Coast um, at any time during one week. And online learning has allowed me to go back to school and make it work for myself and still keep my goals and um, pursuing the um, educational goals that I have. Um, what I don't like about it, I do miss some of the social aspects um, that you would have in in-class. But I also think I've created very strong bonds with my classmates through those discussion posts, through um, our Skype sessions and um, off-site discussions that we still have. I'm also able to um, communicate with my, my professor, I think, more. Um, but I like that my professors are usually very available for email. They're available through text. They're available through phone calls. And so while I do miss some of the social aspects, a lot of other things are still there to keep me connected and keep me um, ingrained in a community online. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Penelope, you're a strong ad advocate of faculty adapting to online education. So what has been your experience as an online professor and why do you suggest that others give it a try? I just wanted to say that um, I loved hearing from the students and uh, a lot of what they said uh, syncs up with what my students have told me. So you're representative in many ways and congratulations on working through an online program. It's a haul. Um, I taught my first online course in 2011. Uh, I was uh, uh, kind of trained and cut my professional teeth at a small liberal arts college where I didn't have to think about online and if I did think about online it was in a pretty uh, pejorative way or derogatory way. But you know, the, the research was compelling. Uh, and I was also drawn to the socially transformative aspect uh, of online education. And so uh, when I was recruited here to build um, the online history master's degree program, I did so with a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, and I was really kind of astounded at the ways that uh, teaching online changed my practice. I had been teaching more than a decade uh, before I taught online. I taught face-to-face -face classes. And um, teaching online really made me much more conscientious about thinking about learning outcomes and the structure of the courses that I taught. Um, I, I think about my, my courses much more holistically than I did when I taught face-to-face. -face. Uh, and that's because uh, you must do a lot of the building before the course launches. So you have to kind of think about the course as a whole unit. Um, I was also challenged by the ways that online teaching um, made me much more careful in my communication. Um, the, the, the ways that students obtain information in an online class, primarily through text. Um, so you have to really think carefully about about presenting students with enough information that they understand the context of things, not just the steps. Um, so I'm much more careful about communicating my ideas uh, in an online environment. Um, and I'm much more conscious of the challenges that my students face. Uh, I thought Maria's comment about how uh, most students online are non-traditional. There is not a type 
of online student. Uh, and and that, that's true um, both demographically and in terms of the, the kind of challenges that, that online students face. Many have families. The vast majority of our students work full time. Um, uh, many are in the military. Um, so they're just, they've got a lot of plates spinning and I'm much more attuned to that in the online environment. I think uh, uh, I'm also drawn to the, the creative and communal dimensions of the, the process of teaching online. Um, when I taught face-to-face -face and developed face-to-face -face classes, it was pretty much an experience or a process that I directed uh, and that I did by myself. I feel much more part of a team when I teach online. I work with instructional designers, platform partners, with students to get feedback about what's working and so on and so forth. And I really appreciate that. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I, I push faculty to engage online despite a lot of reticence on their part because I do think it's a social imperative. Um, online brings more and different people uh, into higher education and, and puts within their reach credentials that are going to allow them to move into leadership positions in places where decisions are made. Um, so online contributes to the diversification of the workplace and halls of power. And so I do see online education as, as socially transformative in that respect. So I, I make sure I talk to faculty about that, about my agenda and about that dimension of online learning. I also encourage faculty to teach online because I think it makes them better teachers. Um, it prompts more reflective teaching. Um, you're asking questions about habits and practices that you've kind of taken for granted and just inherited from your own graduate uh, training. Uh, and I think that's beneficial both to the student and, and to the professor in terms of their personal growth. Um, and I also tell, tell professors that they should participate for two other reasons. One, the students are great. They're incredibly earnest. Uh, the vast majority of our faculty who finally get around to teaching online usually end up at my door and say, wow, I had no idea the students were so great online. Uh, and that's true. Um, and, and finally, they need to get involved because this train is not stopping. Uh, and faculty need to be involved in the governance structures related to defining and evolving online education. So, I, so those, are the, those are my pitches to faculty. Great, thank you. Um, and now I have a question that I'm going to pose to uh, each of you and we'll start with, uh, I guess we'll start with Robert since we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about uh, what are some of the greatest benefits of exclusively online courses and at the same time, where can online learning improve? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, just kudos to CSU Global for putting together this panel. I, I really uh, got a lot out of uh, the comments from Penelope and Maria and Sarah quite a diversity of perspectives. I think it was really well put together. So thanks for including me on the panel. Now you guys are all really embedded either as, as administrators or as students of online programs. I'm a little bit further removed. You know, we're an association that serves folks that do what you do. Um, but I'd like to go back to when I was an associate provost at University of Southern Maine. And we only had about five or six online courses at a time. And it dawned on me, I had no background online, it dawned on me that given my role in outreach, uh, that we really need to move in that direction to, as Penelope, as Penelope said, I knew it was a train and it wasn't gonna stop and it wasn't gonna wait for the University of Southern Maine. I had to, and then we needed leadership. So I thought, let's talk to a bunch of folks around the country about what, who were leaders and what they learned. And one of the things that almost all of them said was that, and this relates directly to your, your question, Jordan, almost all of them said that strategically, make sure you have entirely online degree programs, that if it's just courses, like the University of Southern Maine had for quite a while, that it doesn't meet your strategic objectives because it's not serving a net new audience. Um, and, and that's not that you don't do it, it's just not strategically important for your institution if it's not entirely online. And that doesn't mean there isn't a great virtue in blended programs that serve the kind of learners that Sarah said, where you know she loves the benefits of online but still values the face-to-face -face interaction. And as long as you live by that campus and are able to access the campus, that's a terrific option. And you know, we know that the research shows that it's marginally more effective hybrid than either entirely on ground or entirely online. All that said, the, the virtue of entirely 
um, online is that it massively expands access and serves that social function that Penelope referenced. Um, you know, it really began as a, a technology, a modality that was identified as a bridge for, for, for uh, or as, as a strategy for bridging distance. Um, continuing educators around the country partnered with their IT folks to make that happen, to make sure that rural um, uh, students in particular had access to programs. Um, and certainly that played a huge role and it continues to play a, a huge role. So while Sarah is, is jetting around the country on her job, it allows her to stay connected, certainly continues to be a big boon for uh, folks who are at a distance and live in rural states. But increasingly, we see students that want to access a particular program, and they might live in Buffalo, but the program they want is offered at University of Minnesota, and it gives them an amazing opportunity to access that program that University of Buffalo might not, might not have. And also, I would say that increasingly, we're seeing that, that, that the value of online transcends space and now time. Um, because of the, of the incredible time crunch of the students that were described by Maria, um, it seems to me that one of the most important things is that it addresses folks, even in your local market, who might be right around the corner from the university, but their job and their, their family commitments and a variety of other commitments just simply make it impossible to make it to campus 14, 15 weeks in a row, let alone several chunks of 14 to 15 uh, weeks in a row. And expanding access is really, as Penelope said, really a, a moral imperative and also a financial and economic imperative for our regions and, and frankly our national economy. Uh, because of the skills gap, the only way for us to remain competitive is to dramatically expand access to quality credentials and degrees um, from adults and non-traditional learners um, who increasingly prefer and sometimes can only access uh, programs via online. It's not enough anymore to serve the needs of 18 to 22 year olds because that population isn't big enough for us to remain competitive. Now shifting um, briefly, I'll be more brief on this part, how can online improve learning? I think that uh, I'll just build on what some of the others has, have said um, that paradoxically, online allows for more student-teacher-student -student interaction and more student-student -student interaction. And I say paradoxically because most faculty when, who are not, have not taught online, their, their knee-jerk reaction is that we can't do that because I'll lose all the interaction, but studies have shown there are actually more instances, instances of interaction. It's just not face-to-face, -face, it's, it's online. And second, um, uh, I have a wife who, who is, is, is um, on the more introverted side, and she told me about a book called Shy, I think it's called. And, and you know, in this country, we really privilege the folks who step up in class, in, in class, and dominate the discussion. And online is perfect for introverted individuals who don't feel as comfortable speaking up and or who just have, take, need to take more time to process. Uh, before they contribute. And online is perfect for that audience, and that audience is not a minority. It's a, it's a substantial percentage of our population. So those are just two things I'd say. I would reserve further comments for later. Great. Thank you, Robert. And uh, I'm going to pass the question over to uh, Maria. I, I think Robert covered a lot of it. I would echo some of what we've talked about already, which is the flexibility piece. That's a huge thing for online learners is that they don't have to be in a classroom at a certain time on a certain day. And also, as Penelope talked about, that diversity within the student base, because you get people from all different industries, different parts of the country. You really have a broad base of, um, of demographics and beliefs. And I think the other thing too is that many of these students have really chosen to be here because they may have tried, you know, when they were 18, 19 years old, they may have tried a traditional campus setting and it didn't work out for them for one reason or another. And a lot of them then went off and started their careers, started their families, and now they are coming back and they really want to be here, which again, I think creates a much stronger learning environment because you have that level of engagement 
among most of your students and when they're connecting with each other in those discussion posts. Um, I think that there's just much more of a depth there, plus the knowledge that they bring, having been in the workforce, um, really deepens and enriches that experience. As for what we can do differently, I think that we are seeing that the profile of an online learner is changing a little bit because more and more students are moving to online as it is gaining kind of credibility and reputation and as more and more institutions offer really robust programs. So I think we need to look at how we change with those learners. And one of those things is something that Sarah brought up, which is how do we connect students? How do we have students, how do we get that interaction outside of the classroom for our students? Because we are seeing more and more learners who don't just wanna be here just to get in, turn in their assignments and get out, but they're looking for not a traditional college environment, but they are looking for much more than just being a solo, um, student in there taking care of their coursework. So I think that's one of the areas we can do better is really enriching the experience outside of the classroom. Great, thank you. And uh, Penelope, was there anything that you uh, wanted, wanted to add? To add? Yeah, I would just um, second the integrating, finding ways in terms of improving online, finding ways to fully integrate online learners into the social and intellectual fabric of the university. Universities are incredibly dynamic uh, uh, ecosystems and and I think we we make our best effort to integrate online students in, into that dynamism but I think more can be done um, I, I've mentioned what I think that are the benefits of online learning from a teaching perspective I think it makes you a, a better teacher going through that process um, and I've also mentioned the social transformative bit in terms of improving it uh, also I'd say you know, um, I might be in the minority here, but we have, I think we, we need to do a, we need to make a more concerted effort to not just make online about scaling. Um, so many of the discussions I have about online are about how it allows you to do more with the same amount of resources and to scale up. That's not necessarily true for all disciplines. Um, and if we drive online with the question of scaling, we're going to chip away at the integrity of the liberal arts tradition. And I worry about that. Um, I think that uh, we need to do a better job of putting the dignity of students and uh, instructors at the center of what we do online. Great. And uh, Sarah, did you have any uh, final thoughts on the benefits and drawbacks of exclusively online courses uh, from the, the student perspective? The flexibility. I mean, that's the reason that I chose online was to be able to maintain my work environment and still go back to school. Um, also, I had put off going back to school for a long period of time because I thought I either needed to completely take a year off to go back to a traditional B school for an MBA or I thought I needed to um, invest in going to night school, which would change the nature of the work I could do. Um, and so this also allowed me to stop procrastinating. I was able to just start the program and, and get going. And I, once I took a couple of classes, I really liked it. And so I just kept going with the online program. And um, I think it can help a lot. And a lot of the students that I have interacted with have done the same thing. They kept putting off going back to school until they finally just jumped into online learning. Um, and it allows you to meet your goals that you've set for yourself. Um, thinking about improvements, and this is really going to be about people who are going back to school for grad school, but um, I mean, I was in the workforce for 10 years before I went back to grad school, and so whatever resources that online uh, universities can provide to, to, to students as they re-enter that educational atmosphere, and how do I write a paper again, how do I do research, all of those things are, um, you're, you're teaching yourself again or um, learning how to do them better, and the resources that an online university could help provide would make that transition um, easier. And I think it would have made my transition easier. I think I had a rocky start for my first couple of classes, just getting back into writing research papers and um, learning how to cite my sources and do all that again. Um, and so where that could have been a smoother transition, I think would have made it a better experience for me. Okay, and now I'm going to uh, shift the conversation back to Robert. Um, so UPCEA does a lot of research into best practices in online education. And so can you uh, summarize some of the top points? Oh, Robert, I think you're still on mute. 
Yep, thank you. Why don't I focus on a quality framework that we have developed. Uh, it was written by a team of expert practitioners and leaders in online. Um, but first, let me situate that within the larger continuum of quality frameworks. And I think quality frameworks is really important. Penelope talked about uh, the risks associated with focusing too much on scaling online. And I think the business side of online is complicated and interesting and has all sorts of potential, but she's right to worry about quality, particularly at this time and place, because if we are interested in expanding access through the use of online and scaling up when appropriate, um, for all the reasons I mentioned last time, we have to do it with quality in mind. And the great news is that various bodies have really stepped up and address the quality of the, the concept of quality uh, along the continuum. Most people on this webinar are prob or this virtual conference are probably aware of Quality Matters, which was really first um, in the ball game with their course level quality uh, rubrics. And they've done an amazing job. And whether you use the QM uh, rubrics or you use your own homegrown version, uh, that's clearly swept the nation, and it's been very, very, very helpful in transforming the cultures of our various campuses um, and putting quality concerns sort of to bed, or at least um, nap time. Uh, since then, Quality Matters and also Online Learning Consortium have developed uh, program quality standards, which has been really helped because the next step, of course, after course level is program level. Um, UPSIA looked at that and had no interest in, in, in delving into that. Our, our sweet spot is not academic affairs. It's not actually the teaching and learning in an online environment. It's a lot more about leadership, strategy, entrepreneurialism, um, it's in, a, in essence, the administration of online learning. Um, so we wanted to talk about that level of, of uh, quality. So our uh, hallmarks of excellence in online leadership are about enterprise-wide level, whether it's the entire university or it's a global campus or a very large unit within the university that disproportionately uses online. And among our hallmarks are some of the things that you would even see in the program level quality standards, uh, faculty services, student services, and IT. But we do four hallmarks that are really more in the sweet spot of UPSIA. Um, one of them is, ex is internal leadership or internal advocacy, rather. We want to make sure that your online enterprise is aligned with the overall strategies of your institution, um, your, your mission, um, and larger goals and, and, and values. Um, I think we have a bit of a bias towards a centralized online uh, unit. It doesn't have to be centralized in terms of academics, but in terms of the administrative support structure, uh, uh, you know, faculty and student services, uh, instructional designers, and marketing budgets. It just doesn't make sense to us to have this be an archipelago of resources that are stretched too thin and often competing with one another. We think there's virtues in in, um, in merging and leveraging the efficiency of scale. Uh, so we're a big fan of that. But we also talk about the entrepreneurial enterprise, we talk about external advocacy, and we talk about professionalism. And uh, professionalism is really the, the bookend of, of excellence, right? It's the book, bookmark of quality. This is the time we need to professionalize the profession. Some will argue that online is just another learning modality. I hear that a lot from some of our own members. I don't think it is just another learning modality. Surely it is that, but it is also a profession. It's an emerging profession that is enormously complicated, is not going away. And as we move towards more and more sophisticated production teams, um, it is more and more going to look like a profession, and a profession needs standards. Uh, so that's what we've been focused on at UPSIA, and I, I really think that overall, the organizations in the space have done a really good job of meeting the challenges that, um, that really need to be met, frankly, for online to get to the next level and be accepted as um, just as, 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 a, um, as vital and just as professional as the folks in engineering or business school would be.
Great, thank you, Robert. Some interesting insights there. Um, I just wanted to shift back to uh, Maria. So how does uh, CSU Global work to acclimate students to online learning so that they feel comfortable and ready to succeed, if, especially if they've never taken uh, online courses before? We have a coordinated effort across CSU Global to help students. Um, so our goal is really to provide as much or as little support as they need. I think that's really important is that you have to meet students where they're at and you have to provide that personalized level of service. So I'll talk briefly about the ways our teams help to acclimate students, but we also provide students with a variety of self-service options, including a self-led orientation and a demonstration course they can go and play around in, a searchable knowledge base. We do just-in-time communications to make sure that students know how to navigate through the university at the time that they need. So we do all of those pieces for students who maybe don't want a really in-depth experience it starts in enrollment. Our enrollment counselors do a really great job of building relationships with our students before they start class. They can have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with their enrollment counselor to ask questions. Enrollment counselors really work to help students understand what they're getting into because it is different from a traditional, you know, opportunity for learning. And it is also something that maybe people haven't been in to Sarah's point for five or ten years. So they also can, they do provide what's called a walk to class where they really get in and together they go through the course room with the students and go through some of the resources available, including our writing center, which helps students transition into that APA format and that research based writing. Uh, before our students start class, they work with our tuition planning team that help they ensure all of their finance documents are taken care of. And I think that's important because the reality is if students don't feel secure with the financial side of their education, it's going to impact them in the classroom and distract them. So we want to ensure that the path is clear for them to focus on what's really important in those first few weeks, which is getting comfortable with the online format, the pace of the courses, and feeling confident that they can be successful. Most of our undergraduate students actually start in a specific course that has additional resources and has a deck additional instructor support so that they can kind of ease them in and the instructors understand that these students may be just getting into the online learning platform for the first time and so they're used to working with the same sort of student and understand the challenges they face. And then finally, they have a student advisor assigned to them. Uh, we do a one-stop model of advising here where that advisor can help them with almost anything they need. And the advisor reaches out right after they start classes to get a first appointment scheduled. And that's really critical so that students start establishing a relationship with their advisor and they know that there's someone to turn to if they ever have questions or concerns. Great. And just going back to the, uh, the student perspective, Sarah, um, so how connected did you feel to faculty since you never actually met face to face? And were your conversations all group discussions or did you have any one on one conversations? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your interaction with uh, faculty? Yeah, I think it varies by faculty member and by the course content. So there were there were definitely some some courses where I needed to focus a bit more on um, just group uh, discussions with my peers. But when I needed to reach my my professors, I almost always heard back from them in 24 hours. I would send either individual emails. Um, I had their uh, cell phone numbers if I needed to text them or I could call them. Uh, almost all all of them did office hours. I, I didn't ever utilize office hours because normally my, my questions would come up and I would need an answer before office hours would happen. And that's where email was really helpful. Um, I, so I never really noticed the difference between um, in classroom that I did for my undergrad versus graduate. Um, and I think that that's part of what you're signing up for as a faculty is that you need to be accessible and um, you have, you're dealing with people in different time zones and different work schedules. And so I think uh, my professors have done a great job of just being readily available and responsive to email, text messages, phone calls. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, and just to wrap up our uh, Q&A portion of the panel discussion, uh, I have a question for all four of you. Uh, so how is online education evolving to meet student needs and what might look different in five or 10 years? And I guess we'll start with uh, Penelope. I actually don't know, because uh, the pace of change is, is so quick. Uh, you know, here at ASU, um, next week will look totally different than it looks now. So I, I don't want to make any predictions. I can say what I'm most excited about, new things that I'm working on, are developing external partnerships um, 
that really take advantage of the fact that online is a classroom without walls. Um, so we're, we're exploring partnerships with um, museums and other cultural memory organizations and co-developing curriculum uh, and curricula with, with people outside of higher education. Uh, and I think that online helps us do that. It facilitates that collaboration. So in the future, I think our students are going to have access to uh, archival material and, and um, professionals uh, in, in museums that, that our students on ground won't have access to. Um, so I'm pretty excited about the ways that, uh, that what we're doing kind of really look to leverage the fact that we don't have to deal with walls. And Robert, did you want to chime in with uh, your thoughts? I'll just mention a couple of things. The enormous potential of data analytics, which I bet you is going to soar in the coming years. And the, the virtue of data anal analytics is really twofold. I think it identifies problematic aspects of a course or a module or a program, and that can really be helpful in um, uh, making changes. And then on the flip side of that, adaptive learning, you know, for the individual students so that the success rates and the, and the retention rates are improved. I think the latter is going to become extremely important as we continue this increased focus on learning outcomes that is in part leading towards competency-based education. The second thing I would say is that we're going to move more and more towards very rich multimedia environments that are going to look more and more like a Hollywood studio than what it used to be when you just recorded a professor and called it a day. Um, and I think that that is going to create a lot of winners and losers. So when I look at the next 10 to 15, 15, 10 to 15 years, maybe even five to 10 years, I think tuition dependent institutions are going to be in trouble if they don't get, a, the, get ahead of the curve, or in fact, if they aren't already ahead of the curve in online learning, uh, because they need the adult market to stabilize their budget and to be sustainable financially. And I think when it gets more and more sophisticated, that means more and more costly. And it's going to be very hard for them to catch up with the ones who are the leaders. And there may be some consolidation uh, in the space. So look to see a little bit more innovation too, notwithstanding Penelope's, Penelope's uh, well-reasoned concerns about scaling up. I think you're gonna see more um, experimentation like Georgia Tech's $8,000 graduate program in computer science that is MOOC inspired um, and University of Illinois IMBA program and, and micro degrees and all those other kind of experiments. Can I just jump in here and say, I agree with you, but we've been having those conversations for 15 years. So I'm, I'm a little more skeptical uh, about whether we're going to get to the places that you're talking about, but we'll see. Okay, great. So I'm going to pass it back over to uh, Scott for the uh, Q&A portion. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, we have several questions on the queue. The first one is, how can discussion boards evolve to become more collaborative? Penelope, do you want to take uh, that question? This is something that we um, wrestle with um, because the discussion uh, uh, structures in LMSs are, are clunky by nature. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, in collaboration with platform partners, we can, we can find some new solutions. Um, moving toward things like Yellow Dig tends to make it a little more organic. Uh, we encourage uh, our faculty to use best practices by breaking down discussion into groups rather than having class-wide discussion. Um, but I'm eager to hear what others what others have to say. Okay, did anyone else want to chime in? I think something that has been helpful through my experience is when we have incorporated video chat into discussion boards. Um, and that would come from what Penelope is talking about, those smaller group chats. Um, it does kind of get a bit daunting for the introverts that don't love the um, live discussion, but I do think it makes it adds that interactive nature to it. And, and staying on the discussion board theme, um, is there a way to for a more effective mechanism for teaching and learning math and science class math and science classes using discussion boards? Robert or Maria, do either you want to? Uh... Share your thoughts on that one. You know, I'll be honest, I'm not a curriculum expert. So it's that's not one that I feel like I, I have a really good answer to. But I think it's an excellent point that we need to look at all of our courses and determine what is the right interactivity within there. If it's not a discussion board that gets that collaborative nature going, how do you do that in a math or a science course? Um, and I think it's, it's a very valid question to be asking. And we have to 
ensure that we don't have a cookie cutter sort of mentality with our courses so that we can, you know, so that we are open to other ways of collaboration and learning. This is not my discipline, far outside my discipline, but learning theory tells us that to the extent that we can connect the problems that students are working on with their own lives, um, learning happens or learning, there's a greater potential for learning to happen. So I could see in math and science using the discussion threads to ask students to explore how the theories that they're, they're exploring um, connect to their own lives. Uh, so that's a, at least one way you can incorporate discussion into math and science. The next question is, what do you consider to be the optimal, cla optimal class size for fully realizing online learning outcomes for students? Research shows between 25 and 40. Um, but I think it just depends on the nature of the class. I think there are some classes that scale beautifully. Uh, and there are other classes such as research seminars at the graduate level that, that don't scale well. Uh, and that we will just need to keep small if the students are gonna walk away with the skills that you need to be a researcher in certain fields. Sarah, did you have any thoughts uh, from the student perspective on class size? Anytime I've had less than 15 people in a class, it's not enough to get a good discussion going. So, um, I would definitely say the average of 20, at least in the, at the graduate level, gets enough thought, thought juices going and enough discussion happening to make it optimal for all of the people taking the class. How are you using predictive analytics to better understand student success, retention, and persistence related to online learning? I will say that this is an area that we are really just getting into. I think predictive analytics is um, something that a lot of schools are looking at. Um, we have we are a very data-driven school and so we have always been looking we've always looked at our courses and the success rates there our learning outcomes our retention trying to tie those pieces together and we are moving much more towards the predictive analytics i think that we also have to be careful though of always balancing data with um the right word um, of being about taking a balanced approach with data because you can lose sight of the fact that there are actual people involved when you focus only on the data and people are their own variable as we all know um, and I think that that is is just a cautionary piece of it that we all need to be using more predictive analytics to understand what makes people successful but to also not solely rely on them as our methods for creating courses and programs and services for students. Uh, the next question is, how should future administrators foster staff collaboration and development online within their school structures? So um, this is something that we talk about at an institutional level, how to incentivize faculty to um, collaborate and to be part of online um, course development. Uh, and it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think in the past, uh, and, and actually now we use financial incentives to get faculty involved uh, and collaborating in online curricula. Um, but I think that that, that uh, is a slippery slope because I think if you use financial incentives to get faculty involved, you signal that online is something um, extra or different or apart from the normal work that faculty do on a daily basis. Um, and so you, you have the development of kind of a two cultures or, or a second class citizenship for online students. So it's something we've actually really wrestled with. I think we need to normalize online course development, make it a normal part of a faculty's course load, um, uh, and not incentivize regular course development. Now, if there are new projects that require research or external collaboration, I can see um, uh, uh, you know, using financial incentives to, to make that happen. But it is a, it is a sticky wicket. Uh, well, we have time for one final question, which is how, uh, how are you supporting online only students in terms of their career development opportunities, uh, fostering career development opportunities following graduation? As a fully online university, we've had to embrace that challenge. And so we have a, a virtual career center where students can come and they can access resources for from a career development perspective. We offer free resume reviews and cover letter services to all of our students and alumni. I think it looks a lot 
just like it does on an on-ground campus, except how you interact with people is, is a little bit different. They have the opportunity to schedule appointments with career coaches who are faculty in different disciplines who are able to help them connect their degree to industry, give them insight into what it looks like if they're trying to transition into a new field, um, give them that expertise that you would get from um, an on-ground career center. I think you just have to be um, intentional about your services and if you have a mix of online and ground-based students you really have to think you, you have to put that work into understanding what how you'll translate your face-to-face -face resources into the online environment but it absolutely can be done yeah, I would just say all that and and just one more thing thing that I'd say is online has forced us to really think carefully about what the role of certain degrees is, are in the 21st century. I think online transforms degrees to an extent. So thinking carefully about what's a relevant culminating experience um, given the student population that we're dealing with now, many of whom are online, many of whom are non-traditional. Um, so that's the only other kind of career focused thing I'd add. Robert, did you have any final thoughts? I did. Just in the last 12 to 18 months, our members across the U.S. and, and Canada have increasingly started to focus on these career services. And I think it's in recognition of two things. The fact that um, adult students are more career-oriented. Career or, they have a more utilitarian approach to education where the career is absolutely embedded in their what's driving them so you need to do a better job and the second thing it's it's in response to is largely the the insufficiency of the centralized campus career services and addressing the needs of these distance learners and adult learners in general and what i'm seeing is some companies that are very strong like inside track and mz and others are developing a service where they partner with institutions to help on that front because it's very difficult to scale up and to do a good job if you haven't done it before. And so I think increasingly you're gonna see some of that rather than developing it in the house. Okay, and I'll pass it back to Scott. Thank you. Well, I wanted to thank uh, all of our panelists and our moderator for this very interesting discussion. Thank you.